Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History YouTube channel. Um, I want to talk very briefly about an issue that comes up time and time again when we're talking about history, and it's a concept um, that we refer to as agency. Now, what does this mean? Well, agency is really, um, in some ways, a question of looking at why historical change happens and who makes it happen. Long, long ago, when um, histories were first being written in a kind of a semi-professional way, um, you're looking at during the 19th century, historians were really writing kind of almost as um, a sort of a hobby, uh, and then it became um, a more of an academic pursuit. And the things they were kind of writing were the stories of the great and good, you know, the things that Henry V did at Agincourt, or that Charlemagne did, uh, in the uh, um, creation of the Holy Roman Empire, that sort of thing. And so a perception developed, um, really until the kind of early 20th century, that history happened because great men make it happen. And even today we have, uh, when we're studying history, we have like the, the, the great and the bad. So don't we have the, the likes of Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Winston Churchill, the people that we like and admire for their stoicism, their resolve, their courage. And then, you know, the great villains of history, the people like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. But the, the problem with all of this is it gives us a misleading impression that these characters stride like superheroes across the, the global stage, and they're the people that make things happen. Now, from the 1960s onwards, um, a, a school of history, a, a Marxist school of history, proposed that really history kind of happens from below. Now, ordinary people... Uh, through uh, their endeavours, their day-to-day -day business, their struggles, um, their in countless ways develop uh, and change history in ways that you know, we can't really see, that are imperceptibly small, but over time amount to very big things. And if we're going to be looking at uh, issues within um, GCSE history or A-level history, sometimes it's beneficial to, to take these ideas on board. Let's look at, for example, the issue of civil rights. What makes change happen there? Now, we've got some great figures within the story. We have the uh, people such as Martin Luther King, obviously, and uh, Malcolm X. But if we go back a generation or two, there are people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, and people who are, you know, um, inspi great inspirers of the... Um, uh, ordinary uh, and non-famous uh, uh, black activists. But we have to remember that there are many, many tiers of people below them. Not only are there the activists that fought, that struggled, that were sometimes murdered um, in the Deep South and who uh, went through all manner of privations uh, in order to bring about uh, things like um, desegregation in public places, and on transport and the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, these, these ordinary activists. And below them, there are simply ordinary black, white, Hispanic, Native American and other people um, experiencing this history and, being, and participating it in, in minor, minor ways uh, over time. So when we're looking at why did change happen by, you know, 1964, 1965, is it indeed the case that it was simply people like Martin Luther King saying, making speeches, having marches, and inspiring, you know, ordinary people? Or were ordinary people making the history themselves? Or is there an even more subtle way of looking at this? And I think there is. I think that when historical change happened during the civil rights movement, it's when three factors meet. It's when grassroots activism, the ordinary people who never get a mention of history, who walk, who march to Washington, on Washington in their hundreds of thousands, um, who uh, send in, um, who queue up at polling stations for hours on end waiting to vote, those sorts of people the names of whom we may never know, um, when their action is uh, you know, inspired by the, uh, their leadership, and when those two factors meet the, a third factor, really the, the federal government. Very often, American presidents, not, it's not that they were 
any of them were particularly um, overtly racist or um, wished ill to black Americans, I can only really think of one American president, and in fact, unfortunately, Woodrow Wilson, whose rhetoric is overtly racist. Um, the majority of them saw the South as a problem that they didn't know how to fix, that they didn't know how to fix without risking a civil war, that they kind of hoped would go away, and that um, they hoped would, you know, somehow heal itself over time as hopefully people became more prosperous. And when the leaders of the civil rights movement and their, the grassroots members that they led presented Washington with an unreconcilable problem and presented Washington with a crisis in the South that could be televised and broadcast across America and across the world, then American presidents had to act. Not only did uh, presidents like Eisenhower during the um, desegregation of schools in the South have to act because the Constitution had been openly flouted, and if a president's job is not to preserve the Constitution, it's pretty much nothing else. But also, um, everybody from Truman onwards had to be appearing, at least, to be presenting America as a paragon of virtue, of freedom, of justice in the world, because it had to act as a moral counterpoint to the Soviet Union. If it didn't do, then how could America be a leader to all the countries in Africa, in Asia, in South America that were freeing themselves of colonialism and looking for one or other way, perhaps, to go in the world, either to join the Soviet camp or to join um, America's um, free market, liberal democratic uh, sphere of influence. So America had to appear to be um, morally superior, and people like Martin Luther King, along with hundreds of thousands of other black Americans, could present it as not being so. So, anyway, back to this issue of agency. Agency, um, the responsibility for making historical change happen here, is really divided between the grassroots, the rank and file, the leadership, and the federal government itself. And the reason why historical change happens is it's very much an intersection of these things. It's what happens when these three forces collide, kind of like atoms colliding and sort of particles spinning off. History is kind of like that process of change. And you can perhaps look at this when we're looking at other major uh, processes of change occurring. So always be thinking when you're looking at history and you're looking at, you might be studying the Russian Revolution, you might be studying Lenin, you might be studying Nazi Germany and looking at someone like Adolf Hitler. And these people can't make change happen without the many millions below them. And the many millions below them tend not to um, make conscious political decisions, conscious historical decisions. They don't see themselves normally as historical actors, like the way that people like Gandhi or Lenin or Hitler did. And so the, the one cannot kind of bring about change without the other. Anyway, I hope that's been useful for you. If you need any other help, you can always get me at info at explaininghistory.com. You can check out our podcast and you can access that by going to www.explaininghistory.com. Thanks very much. Bye bye.